Welcome to Japan Politics Explained, where we review recent news and statistics regarding politics and elections in Japan. Today I'm going to analyze the results of the Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly election that was on the 4th of July to see what lessons we can take from it as we approach the national general election this autumn. It may seem a bit too late to be talking about an election that happened over a month ago, but this channel did not exist back then and the Tokyo election is too interesting to not talk about. So let's dive in. First, let's recap. The election was held for the Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly, which covers all of Tokyo as a to or prefecture. The election uses a plurality voting system in which a candidate with the most votes are elected into office. There are 42 electoral districts, most of which are based on Tokyo's municipal districts, such as wards, cities, and towns. A total of 127 seats were up for grabs, with the smallest electoral district voting for one assembly member and the largest voting for eight. Assembly members have four-year terms, and that means Tokyo held its last election in 2017. Now let's look at the political parties in contention. Almost all of the parties that fielded multiple candidates in the race are part of national political parties, with the exception of two. Tokyo Tomi Fastonokai is the regional party supporting Tokyo Governor Yuriko Koike. There is also the Tokyo Sekatsha Network, the political arm of a consumer co-op. Now let's dive into the results. There was no clear winner in the election, as it ended basically in a three-way tie instead of anyone getting an outright majority. The Liberal Democratic Party and Komeito, which are the coalition partners in national politics as well, fell short of the majority threshold with a combined 56 seats. The opposition bloc, made up of the Constitutional Democratic Party and the Japanese Communist Party, settled on a combined 34 seats, while Tomi first won 31 seats. Without a clear majority for her nor against her, Tokyo Governor Yuriko Koike will have to work with the parties on an issue-by-issue -issue basis to get her policies through. Based on these results, let's look at the lessons learned so that we can apply them to future elections. Number 1. Yuriko Koike is a force to be reckoned with. The number of Tomi first seats does not look good at first glance, especially when compared to their previous seat count, but it's important to remember that almost nobody expected the party to do this well. According to the election news website Senkyo.com, one election strategist predicted that Tommy First will only get 9 to 12 candidates elected, losing much of their current seats to the LDP. But Tommy First was able to clinch almost triple the number of seats, preventing the LDP and Cuomento from becoming the assembly majority. Let's look at what was behind the party's unexpected strength. One major factor was that there was public discontent toward the national LDP, especially over their COVID-19 policies and its insistence on holding the Tokyo Olympic Games amid the pandemic. But that doesn't fully explain why Tomi was able to defend its seats. Discontent towards the LDP could have worked to boost the CDP and JCP, or could have kept people staying home and not going to the ballot box. This is where the power of Yuriko Koike comes in. As the governor of Tokyo, she has shown an ability to govern, making her party a credible alternative for many voters who see the CDP and JCP as the permanent opposition, inexperienced and unfit to rule. Koike has frequently used her position as the chief of Japan's most populous prefecture to pressure the central government, making her stand out from the yes people in the LDP. Koike is especially popular among independents, and the votes of independents are especially difficult to read, which led to many strategists making underwhelming projections for Tommy First's seat count. What does this all mean for the upcoming general election? It's not very clear considering that Tommy First is, at the end of the day, a regional party with no presence in national politics, and Koike is just a governor. But if she were to test her chances and try to make her way into national politics, it's reasonable to expect that she will be a strong candidate among independents nationwide and capable of presenting herself as someone who can govern. One survey found that Koike is the prime minister candidate of choice for many LDP supporters, despite her not even being in the LDP. Her ability to win over independents and be a credible candidate may end up leading her to the prime minister's seat. Check out my previous video for more on that. Number 2 cooperation between the opposition parties works. Both the CDP and the JCP have been able to increase their seats at the Metropolitan Assembly, albeit not to the extent they were hoping for as a result of Tommy First's unexpected strength. But the increase in seats was not given to them on a silver platter. It came as a result of thorough negotiations between the two parties to make sure they did not hurt each other's chances of victory. 
Ever since the LDP rose back to power under Prime Minister Abe in 2012, the national opposition parties have been fragmented and not strong enough to individually beat the LDP. To overcome this issue, parties have been aiming to form electoral agreements in which only one opposition candidate stands in each electoral district so as to not split the left-wing vote. The talks initially did not go well, as there were many conservative members in the Democratic Party, which was at the time the largest opposition, that did not want to work with the communists. But after 2017, when Yuriko Koike effectively triggered a divorce between the DP's conservative and liberal members, the role of largest party went to the newly born CDP, made up of former Democratic Party liberals. That made it much easier for talks on electoral cooperation, leading to successes in some regional polls. The CDP and the JCP continue that strategy into the Tokyo Assembly elections, and it's clear to see that it has paid off for the districts in which talks led to a unified candidate. Let's look at some examples. Shibuya, with two seats up for grabs, was won by Takashi Nakata of the CDP and Airi Ryuen of Toming First. In this constituency, the JCP did not run its own candidate, helping the left coalesce behind Nakata. With the LDP candidate less than 800 votes behind the second place candidate, it would have been an uphill battle for the left had the JCP fielded its own candidate. Another example of this is Hino. With two seats available, Toming First's Naoshi Sugawara and JCP's Toshiko Shimizu clinched victory, while the LDP's Masahito Nishino fell just 2,000 votes shy. It's obvious that if the CDP had ran its own, both left-wing parties will have lost out. Now let's look at the flip side. In North Tama No. 3 district, and South Tama, and Nishitokyo and Minato, the CDP and JCP both ran candidates and both lost out. If we take a closer look at North Tama No. 3, we see that the JCP candidate lost by only 300 votes, while the CDP lagged behind them but won over 20,000 votes. Of course, negotiations for a unified candidate aren't easy, because you're basically giving away a seat you had a possibility of winning. There are slight differences in the two parties' policies too, so it's not as easy as making adjustments within your own party. There is also the issue of whether voters who are supporters of one party are willing to cast a vote for the other. Nevertheless, electoral cooperation looks to be a winning strategy for the CDP and JCP, and the success at the Tokyo polls will probably help negotiations for upcoming lower house elections as well. Number 3. Nippon Ishin is aiming for the national stage. With the Tokyo election resulting in a three-way tie between the LDP Komeito coalition, the CDP-JCP bloc, and Tommy first, it's easy to dismiss Nippon Ishin as one of the losers. And going by the numbers, Ishin is a loser, being able to elect only one of its 13 candidates. And 10 of the 12 candidates that lost were not even runners up in the respective districts, so it's hardly a great outcome from the right wing party. But it's possible to view Ishin's performance in the Tokyo elections as a sign of a long term strategy with a focus on improving its chances on the national stage. What do I mean? For starters, Ishin was not expected to win more than one seat in pre-election predictions, so it's hard to think that Ishin believed it would gain many seats. And, if that were the aim, Ishin should have concentrated their resources on just a handful of races where they had a shot at winning. But that's not what they did. They fielded candidates widely across Tokyo, even in places where the strong presence of establishment parties meant that Ishin candidates could not expect to gain even 5% of the votes. What is more likely to have been the aim is this. Use the assembly elections as an opportunity to boost the party's profile in the Tokyo area. Ishin was born from a regional party whose purpose was to achieve the Osaka Metropolis Plan, which took issue with government administration in Osaka Prefecture. With the Metropolis Plan having been voted down in two prefecture-wide referenda, with the last one taking place just last year, Ishin has basically lost its initial purpose. To make a comeback, the party is trying to pivot, presenting itself as an alternative to the LDP within the right. For that, Ishin needs to spread its influence outside Osaka and the Kansai region, especially to other major cities like Tokyo. So Ishin's dozen long-shot candidates can be seen as vehicles for boosting recognition of the Ishin name in the Tokyo area. It was, in a way, an investment to get a foothold outside of the Osaka region. From this, 
we can see that Ishin is very serious about expanding its sphere and gaining seats outside of Osaka in the upcoming lower house election. They may be able to gain votes from right-wing voters disgruntled with the LDP. That's not to say that Ishin is in a position where they can expect to win easily, otherwise they would have won more seats in the Tokyo Assembly elections, but it's worthwhile to keep an eye on the party. The Tokyo Assembly races are often seen as bellwether elections. The former Democratic Party of Japan achieved a solid victory in the Tokyo polls before taking the prime minister seat in 2009. The LDP staged a strong showing in the 2013 Tokyo polls before claiming victory in the upper house election later that year. While Tomi First's victory in 2017 did not lead to the downfall of the LDP in that year's general election, it did give Yuriko Koike the momentum to change the political landscape significantly by breaking up the Democratic Party. So it's clear that the results of the recent Tokyo elections can give us big clues for predicting what we can expect to see in the lower house election later this year. Thank you so much for watching and let me know in the comments what content you'd like to see in future videos.